Um, hey, good morning. Good morning. Hey, hey. Good morning, all. I'm David Grind. I know you're not used to seeing such a good looking person up here to run your meeting. But uh, Dick Brandon had a family event today and he asked me to fill in. So here I am. Uh, I'd like to remind you all there's some refreshments in the back. Please feed the kitty. And before we get too far into this, uh, any visitors today? Visitors? Yes? But not you. Several. <laughs> Several <laughs> visitors. All right. We're going to stand up, tell us who you are. Kayla Speed. I've worked with him. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're sorry. <laughs> you were those medical people then, huh? All right. All right. Speed, Speed visitor. Thank you. Good to see you. Any other visitors this morning? Ah, uh, here's a good new, oh, visitor, yes, sir. Who are you? Good. Glad to have you. Thomas? Yep. Yep. Very good. And uh, any new NMRA members? Bruce Friedrichson. Very good. Hey, hey. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Bruce. Yeah. Um, I... That's enough. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> as, as a lot of you probably know, we're a modular club, so that's where I can do all my modeling in HO scale. Um, How'd you get started? How long you been doing this? What do you like to model? What's your railroad? We all inquiring minds want to know. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm more of a modeling guy than a railroad guy. So I guess my allegiance is probably more toward the BM and BNSF. Yeah. Very good. Where's David Crumpton? I know he's around. Where is he? All right. Hey, we want just to say something about the club here, sir. Sure. Thank you. Uh, sir, we'll have you here for the first time. Would you raise your hands? Great. Welcome to the Welcome to the Texas Western Model Railroad Club. We're glad you're here. Uh, we have the distinct pleasure and honor of being able to host the Division One meeting on the first Saturday of every month. We're glad to do it because it brings people in that maybe not have seen our layout before. Uh, we work on it off and on during the week. And it's a work in progress. Like my wife says, a model railroad is never finished. And she's right. <laughs> By the time you get it done, there's something you want to change. So we're glad you're here. Uh, after the meeting today and after the clinic, take a, take a little time to walk around and look at the progress that we're making in certain areas on the layout, uh, particularly in the Fort Worth area, uh, on the backside around our logging area. Uh, you'll see a lot of changes, but we're now to the point where we're doing scenic work. So you see changes fairly rapidly, but we're glad you're here. We hope you have a good time today. If you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, I forgot my hat this morning, but if you see a guy with a, a red hat on, they can tell you everything you, you, you want to know about the layout. Right there? All right, good. All right, Thanks, thank, thank you, David. Uh, Dean Ferris not here today. I didn't see him. No, no. All right, Dean's layout was uh, featured on a March issue of NMRA magazine, National Magazine. It is the fifth uh, month in a row that a local um, layout has been featured in the magazine. Uh, and we know why, because we're trying to get folks to come to our convention in August. So it's all a lead up to that. Uh, it was a great article, some great pictures as always. Uh, it's a great layout if you've never seen it. It's really nice. Um, something about some train shows going on uh, right today. Uh, Joe Leesing and Ken Kaiser are at the Train of Palooza and Grapevine. Uh, they're at a table promoting the NMRA. Uh, that, that show is today and tomorrow at the Grapevine Convention Center. And you got to pay five bucks to get in, but I understand it's pretty good. This is the ninth one they've had. First time they've had it for two days, so sounds like it's it's really growing. 
Uh, the Plano train show, which was in January, uh, we had 4,000 over 4,063 uh, paid uh, attendees, which is the largest in 10 years. So it was a great show, apparently. I was not there, but uh, it's good. I was in Aruba. <laughs> and um, the, the club uh, was, uh, as you know, we're members of the, club, of the organization that puts on the show. So we get a little kickback from the uh, kickback. That's not no, right. That's no, not no, it. No, no, we get, we, we, we get, we, we get, we get participation the awards. It was over $2,100 this time. So that's good. I think that's probably for both shows, but. It is it's yeah. for both shows, and that's the most that we've deposited in the last four years. Yeah, it was good. So, um, some other train shows coming up April 1st, the Greater Tulsa Train Show. I have information on it if you want. April 15th to 16th is the New Brownsville Train Show. And of course, in August, uh, National Train Show, a National NMRA Convention is here, Grapevine. So, uh, Hopefully, you all registered. There, I, yeah, I just said that. You missed the uh, Hi, April first uh, Rocky Mountain train show. Rocky Mountain? It was that being be in Colorado? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, good guess, right? Uh, all right. So that's what's going on now. Uh, hand up. Sir. Oh, hand up. Oh, Thomas. Yes, sir. It's not a convention, but the Spring Creek is set up at Haggard Library in Plain, in, uh, uh, Plain or Richards, and I forget which, up on the north side of Dallas, thing tomorrow. Uh, okay, where is it? Uh, Haggard Library. Haggard Library. Yeah. All right. It's Plain yeah. <clears throat> All right, we come to a point in a uh, meeting we always have uh, Q&A. Uh, what questions do you have about your modeling experience going on now? Anybody? We've got a lot of answers here. Maybe a couple of good ones even. Any questions? No. I have a comment. Yes, comment. Uh, what you just said about the model railroad is never finished. Uh, I was thinking about it. If you consider prototypes, a real prototype, any one that's finished. Yeah, yeah right. All <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you have the natural, you know, just a punch to change your railroad, do it. Sure. That's what happens in real life. I don't know the fellow's name, but there is a guy that models a railroad, a modern railroad, and about every two years, he dumps the equipment that's no longer on that railroad, and he starts over again. Really? Yeah. Like so, I mean, he keeps it up to date. Is As, he a doctor or a pilot? Yeah, or right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A lawyer. A lawyer, yeah, a lawyer. Yes, yes, sir. Question? Yes. I've got a question. For all the folks here, I've been modeling the Norfolk and Western and the Chesapeake and Ohio. The usual folks never made it here except as part of a consist with somebody else. I'd like to get a feel for how many people here model primarily Santa Fe. Santa Fe, raise your hand. All right. Southern Pacific. Yeah, SP. Okay. Union Pacific. Double one behind you. We'll have a monitor. Okay. Yeah. Texas and Pacific. Yep, right here. A lot of us. Missouri Pacific. Even better. <laughs> All right. Another railroad. That in 1962 was around here. Katie, Frisco, Rock Okay, thank you. How about New York Central? Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> and now you know. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the day, yes. Yeah, yeah, up in St. Louis. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know who it was, but I read yeah, about he, it. He, like in your every year, every other year. Yep. And he'll go the latest equipment. It's amazing. amazing. He gets he get, rid of the old stuff. Doesn't get rid of it; it just goes on a shelf. Oh, is that what happens, really? Yeah. Oh. I mean, he, he something he trades. Yeah, 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 right. But most of it, he's still an engine. Like can't speak to the lowest stuff. Yeah. yeah. But engine. Most what? Of what? Uh, what? What railroad is it? Utah Bell. Utah Bell. Uh huh. Wow. 
Yeah. Sure. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, for all the division uh, members, the Texas Western Mile Railroad Club has started a project um, called Train Sets for Kids. That's what I named it, for lack of a better term. And what we're doing is we're building inexpensive train sets that use equipment, DC equipment that people may have sitting on a shelf. We especially need engines and snap track. So if you have any of that and uh, no longer need it, it's collecting dust, if you could bring it to a division meeting, we will uh, try and overhaul it, get it running, and then we're uh, selling it at the Plano training to go and they reduce the cost, trying to get fathers and sons or mothers and sons or daughters and fathers interested in model railroading at a very inexpensive price. If you look at the price of train sets, brand new, it's uh, a stopper for a lot of people. Thank you. Yes, sir. Great. Great project. Thank you for doing that. Anything else? Comments, questions? Answers. Yep, there he is. Yes, sir. Uh, does anybody have any experience or equipment with building a velocity at my home? Okay, I got a job for somebody you pay. Wow, the question with no answer. Great. I want an answer with no question. No? Okay. All right. Anything else? Moving on? Moving on, moving on. All right. Did anybody bring anything for show and tell today? Yes? Let's see it. Bring it up here. <laughs> if you've got a show and tell already, you can... You know, come forward and we'll get you on next. One of the things I've been working on for the longest time is diesel engine terminal. You know that gunk in the track. You can't just paint it black. You can't throw down cinders and paint over that. It doesn't look realistic. I found on YouTube some guy in England years ago, developed a technique. Uh, Larry Puckett, the DCC guy, yeah. has a YouTube channel. He did this a few months ago, something similar. Uh, I, I should have done it because I did it before Larry. But I don't have a YouTube channel. So I wanted to show you how it's done. It's very effective and it's very easy to do. The key is two keys. One is modeling clay. This is called DAS, D-A-S. You can get it at Michael's. I ordered it online. It was cheaper. Um, you Now, this technique is good for O, S, and H-O. It, it, you need finer <clears throat> fingers than mine to do it in N uh, because of the physical limitations of the clay. You put the clay between the web, web of the between the rails and on the ties now i deliberately put this on real thick uh to show what not to do you want to try to get it pre thin out the clay press it down before you put you know almost like play but press it down thin because you don't want it i uh, certainly don't want it above the rail head and you need to keep it. Should I point this to the camera? No, you, you're all set. Right. You're, oh, yes, you're, on the camera. you're on camera. Okay. You're doing well. Because you want to keep it below the railhead, and you want to keep it out of the web of the rail. Otherwise, your engines will derail. Or any car you run through, it'll derail. I deliberately put this one up high so that, oh, yeah, this looks really nice, like street running. No, well, your engines are going to derail. All right? So, you, pardon me, you squeeze it down. And you can come up and see if you want on the brake. You can barely see the outline of the ties, which is what I was looking for. It takes about 24 hours to dry. <clears throat> and that's what it looks like. When you're laying it down, 
no matter how hard, how careful you are, you are going to get clay is going to go into the web of the rail. I use a toothpick to pull it out. And of course, that kind of lifts out some of the clay, so you've got to roll it back. You know, it's one of these two steps forward, one step back kind of thing. And I, I, if you like this idea, I suggest just practicing on a piece of track before you do it on your layout. When it dries, you want to paint it. The secret ingredient is talcum powder. Talcum powder. Because it adds a tech. If you just paint this, it looks like you just threw paint over, over the clay. You can see it's paint. The talcum powder adds a texture to it. A roughness, if you will. If, if you just visualize, you can see pictures of oily track and engine terminals. It almost looks like it's lifting up slightly, etc. That's what the talcum powder uh, 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 imitates. The colors I use, and I just, you know, like any of us who do painting, I put them on different spots on a on a palette or on a piece of paper plate, and I kind of pull and mix. I use. Craft paint, this is uh, metallic black, <laughs> some burnt umber. Believe it or don't, this makes a difference. This is Vallejo gunmetal blue. You want to add a couple of drops of this into your mix. It gives it that oily look. Exactly, Mike. If you don't do it, well, you <laughs> might as well just paint it flat engine black. And it's not going to look like that oily, greasy crap between the rails. Gunmetal blue, and this is MSP Products Master Series Paint, and this is Muddy Brown. <coughs> a couple of drops of this. <coughs> Mix it all up. There's no secret formula. A little more black and burnt umber than the gunmetal blue or the muddy brown, but <coughs> when your eye, it looks like that oily mess between the rails. Start painting it on. When you're done, you probably take a couple of coats. When you're done, just I use a popsicle stick that clean the rails with that. I don't like using a bright boy because it, you know, loose scratches, micro scratches on the rail head. Um, invariably, uh, whatever's underneath, uh, it's a good idea, to, you know, paint your surface brown or something like that, black, whatever you're doing in, in your engine terminal. Uh, I use a couple of coats of the paint mixture. If you run out and you need to make up some more, it doesn't have to be the exact same color mix because it isn't in real life. Um, anyway, I'll uh, I'll pass this around. It's easier than everybody coming up here to look at it. Uh, this obviously is the painted piece. <laughs> this is what, what it looks like when the dust is dry. That's really about it, but it, it's very realistic looking. And um, uh, it wouldn't work in a steam terminal, obviously. But this is it for a diesel terminal. So I'll pass it along if anybody would like to look. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, sir. Do you apply the talcum powder to the clay? No, no, no. I, that's part of the paint mix. Paint. Okay. The, the, the clay is just the clay. And then the talcum powder, and then you know, we'll draw in the paint, mix it all up, and get a little more talcum powder if you want. It's like mixing. Any paint mix, any custom paint mix. Um, no need to add thinner. You don't want thinner. Or you'd like it to be a little thick. So it's uh, it's very it's very easy to do. Oh oh oh! One thing I forgot to mention. No matter how careful you are, when it dries, oh gosh, I, that clay is too high up the railway. Just use a number eleven blade, a chisel blade, in your in your modeling knife, and you can just chop it out. And it, it comes right out. You have to replace your blade after that because it loses the sharp edge, but that's okay. It's the way it works. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Dave. This Deb has uh, some scenery items, it looks like. Um, yeah, kind of combination of some tips and tricks. So, because I'm not a modeler i'm a painter I, I do the scenery stuff i don't know anything about any of the track it i don't i try to just tune it out sure. but <laughs> you can work I on paint. my layout i paint <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Um, so this is kind of a combination of to, to show this, but also tips and tricks. I was having problems when I was painting on rock, getting it chalky enough. Okay. It to me always would look like too much sheen to it. And I tried different techniques and whatever. And then, you know, using the plaster over it, it still would look shiny. And what I do is I take drywall mud, mix it 50 50 with my paint, and put it directly onto the foam. Drywall mud. And it makes a solid. The pre mixed Yeah, I buy it in the box at yeah. Home Depot. Sure. I get the kind of mid-grade stuff that says little shrinking and whatever. Don't have any problems with cracking like I was with the plaster. I can mix that and put it in a jar and keep it for weeks. Unlike the plaster, you got to mix a little bit of it and use that and, you know, how hard that is to work with. This gives me a solid surface, but not so, not so hot, solid that I can't poke trees into it and, and do what have you, and gives me the chalky look that I was going for. Have you tried uh, grout? Uh, grout to me has a slightly too gritty a texture. Uh, the drywall mud, I can still work with it and carve in it and, and work it the way I want to. The, and the grout also has its, its once you mix it up and get it ready, it's a little bit like the plaster. You only have a short period you can work with it. This, I literally, my base coat always has about a 50-50 mixture with my paint, my base color paint. So like this was what I painted the base with. And um, then the other parts, when I'm doing the detail in it, you know, I just put probably more like 25-75. Um, cause that chalks it out enough, but still makes it workable thinner that I can work with it a little better. And it's working great so far. I am really impressed with it. Yeah, show the picture that you, uh, modeling. So this is what we're modeling. This is the uh, Black Hill, South Dakota. So that's why it looks like spires and what have you. Yeah, you're welcome. You can pass this around. It doesn't weigh anything. I'll give it my chance. <laughs> and then the other thing, this was a combined effort. We're doing some trees. We've got millions of them to do. We used, um, what are these? Bamboo skewers. Bamboo skewers. I forgot. And then um, drill the wires through them and then put the turf on it. And then a little airbrushing to get them a little darker to the color we like. How long did they make came one up? of those trees? Um, this one, he had it all pre-done with the wires through it, and I think yeah. that took him about an hour, and it probably took me mm -hmm. about 30 minutes or so to do the rest of it. Beautiful. <laughs> what do you say? All I do is put the turf on. Oh, I see. All right. Yeah, she's always telling me what to do. Good <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll follow you to make these trees. Take the bag of your little bowl and do it every so often. We take a slide of wire, we poke it through to make yes. all your armatures. <coughs> but I've tried it before. Yeah, you've done it before. Yeah, I've done it before. Yeah, you've done it Yeah, you've done it before. 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 Yeah, you've my spray adhesive, and I spray with spray adhesive, then I spray spray paint on it, and it makes it stick real good to the metal. Then I'll turn it upside down, and I'll spray the glue on it, trying to keep it off the trunk. And I'll use the multicolors of the brown and the lighter green and do the bottom. Because if you look at the pine trees, you're getting a lot of dip on the bottom. Then I'll take a stiff bristle brush, and I'll come back through and kind of knock the static grass off the trunk. Then I'll spray it again and I use the light two millimeter static graphs and spray it, sprinkle it, shake it off, and spray it again and put the darker on there, then shake it off. It'll come back with scissors and kind of clean them up a little bit. Then clean the trunks off one more time. <laughs> then I come back with my bark brown, it's burnt umber or whatever, and start 
and your trunk. So if a little grass gets left on the trunk, it's okay because it gives it a bark texture, actually. Just got to stroke it downwards to make it look like a pine tree. And then to get the dark color, like the um, ponderosa pines is, I use, uh, um, take my airbrush, and I put a little dark green in it, flat green, and just kind of dust the tops of them. And it also helps kind of make the pine needles stand up a little bit more too when you do that. It works pretty good. This one back here was my first attempt. And this is just twisted wire. So like 15 bundles of wire, twist them, take a few out, make the branches, twist them some more. That took four hours. I go, this is no way to make trees. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw a guy do this on YouTube. I go, listen, that's so hard. I figured this one out. And they make pretty decent. Yeah, they look really nice. Pretty decent looking ponderosa pines. Um, the cool part about it, if you're doing fur, you just got to add more branches and a different shape. Ponderosas are more straight up. It's more cylindrical than they are cone shape, but it didn't turn out too bad yeah. for, for what they are. We only have, I don't know, 7,612 to go. <laughs> She's got to get busy. <laughs> uh, I gotta, I gotta paint a building, so she's gonna do this. But uh, we just want to things we came up with. And Great job. Any questions here? All right. Why don't we take that, put it in the back? We'll. Uh, is there some place back there we can put it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just there's a table around the corner in the back. Yep. All right. Very good. All right. Any other show and tell? Yes, sir. Morning. How are you? Doing pretty well. Good. Right the fact, I didn't trip over the camera. I want to put in a little bit of plug for the uh, uh, June prototype modelers meet, which is going to be in um, um, here in the Fort Worth area. This is some stuff. This is kind of a teaser. I'm going to be doing a kind of a preliminary version of a talk that's going to be done at the National in August. I'm doing a talk on Railroad Express cars, and anybody want to take a wild guess who might have a yellow Express car circa 1955? You don't count. 1955? <laughs> 1955 era, yeah, the Katie, yeah, still knew exactly what this was because I've been picking his brain for this. Stuff. This is actually a CB&T car. I think a lot of us bought these things, and they went into the closet like, okay, you take it out and the parts don't fit. If you tell yourself it's a resin car body, uh solid piece resin car body and put on say parts from different people i've been using a lot of stuff as a tangent uh you got a car that you bought for two dollars and put probably twenty dollars worth of parts on <laughs> but anyway that's kind of what i did right here and of course i had did pick up only one of the old sunshine kits that was out a couple of years ago it's really easy to do this was an evening project and i even painted this with a rattle can don't tell anybody and this is a complete resin uh, Missouri Pacific um, express mail card done by a friend of mine, Chad Boas. No, he is not a snake. Um, but he does resin castings like that. Now, again, this is kind of a plug. I'm going to put these on the table back there. I'm doing a plug for the RPM meet, 24th of June in Fort Worth Red Rubber RPM. Also, I'm going to do the complete talk in which I actually get it. You can see these things. I'm also doing new stuff for this talk that I've got to be presenting at the NMRE National in August. You know, there are a lot of other things. Of course, you all get to actually look at the stuff a little bit ahead of time where other people do just be able to probably see it on a, uh, on a PowerPoint. That's all I have. I know we're kind of running right on no, time. No, you're fine. You're good. All right. Any questions for Jim? All right. I know. Yeah. Okay. I thought I saw a hand. Yeah. So anyway. Okay, very good. Thank you all. All right. Anybody else show and tell? All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. All right, we have some uh, tips and tricks, sir. You're up. I uh, this is Mike Matthew, by the way. I'm Hey, hey say hi, how's Mike. everybody? Good. Um, I uh, was asked to kind of do a couple of tips and tricks for you guys. I thought I would uh, bring up my toolbox. I I have been carrying a toolbox to conventions and have this portable toolbox. Uh, it's a fishing a fishing tackle box that I got at uh, Cabela's a long time back. Uh, this one has four drawers in it. 
the drawers come out obviously and each drawer is a separate issue okay so this one is markers and uh and brushes of different types and this one if you can see in here some of these markers are like uh, furniture touch-up markers that are in different colors of wood so you can get those at michael's or at, at hobby lobby uh, they're good for just little touch-up things. Um, the next drawer that I've got here is, uh, this one is uh, what I consider my sharp things drawer. It's all different types of X-Acto knives and cutting things and burnishing tools, uh, razor blades. Got some small clamps in here and some, um, some glass uh, microscope uh, gla glass covers for any glass that I want to use and windows that I want to put in. This one is for screwdrivers and uh, different types of drills and screwdrivers in the in the uh, this particular area and tweezers, all different kinds of tweezers that some are uh, reverse uh, tweezers that will hold something that you have to squeeze them to get it to release. Some are, are regular tweezers uh, and then there's also a burnishing tool in there. I mean, a, a, a small tool for Micromark. I'll show you what I'm talking about. This is uh, this little tool right here. Uh, that's not what I was thinking it was. Sorry. Anyway, I've got a tool that that's a stippling tool. That's a, a, a tool that you extend out and it's got little metal uh, pieces on the end of it. And you can use it for scraping and, and uh, um, marring wood and uh, plastic structures to give it some texture. Um, the final drawer is all kinds of adhesives and glues and sandpapers. And I get all this stuff separated out so that whenever I'm looking for a particular thing, I just go to that drawer. Now the top of this toolbox right here has got a square it's got a cutting board, and in my older age, a magnifying glass. Um, and then it's, I've got four or five pairs of uh, needle nose of different types, uh, point needle nose, regular needle nose, flat nose needle nose, really broad tweezers <laughs> right there. Um, I've got uh, some clamps here a flashlight because whenever I'm going to a contest room, I'll normally carry a flashlight for judging. Uh, one of the things that Dwayne has brought to the table and told us about uh, that is a very, very useful tool, not necessarily for drinking a shot glass because sometimes we need it if we're modeling too much, but, but if you turn this shot glass upside down, it's a great place for you to put glue on the top of the shot glass. And whenever you're gluing parts, you can dip into your glue right here. And then when it's all said and done, like I'm gonna do right now, you just come in there and pull the glue that's dried right off just like that. And, and you're ready to go again. Um, then finally, the thing I wanted to tell you about, and we're gonna put it up here on the screen, I think. Give me a second. You can't tell me this is well to me. I just did. Yeah. You're you're nimble. Yeah, we'll get there. Um Kaufman Engineering. I don't know if you're familiar with these people or not. If you're not familiar with them, you need to be familiar with them, especially if you're building buildings. Uh, Kaufman Engineering. Uh C O F F M A N E N G dot com. They make clamps. This is a 90 degree clamp. It's one of their small clamps. And you literally can open it up and put your building in right here. There's a slot cut open right here for you to be able to glue the corners. You get a perfect 90 degree fit every single time. And it is a perfect tool. You clamp it down, you can leave it and they come in different lengths. I've got about, oh, I guess eight or 10 of these guys in various lengths. 
So if I'm doing a small building, a larger building, whatever. They also have a parallel clamp where you can butt two, two walls up side, side to end, it, end to end and make it right there. And here's the, here is the, uh, the website for Kaufman Engineering. Uh, these, these guys are not, are not necessarily inexpensive, but they're darn sure worth the money and it's going to help you make great corners on your buildings. Uh, they've got some new things that they brought out. One of the, which was a, um, a tool to check the gauge on calipers on your slide down a little bit more. Right, the, a little bit, no, up, well, go up, 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 right there. They can check the gauge on your different sizes of trucks, and you can set them to make sure they're all right and help you set your trucks up accordingly, no matter what scale you're working in and what gauge you happen to be in that scale. So um, that's just a couple of tips and tricks. Uh, we're probably at some point going to do a... Uh, a clinic that will film and put online of, uh, I know you guys probably follow in the NMRA magazine, uh, Jack Hamilton's column, the tool guy I'm in, in the back of every month of the NMRA magazine. Uh, I'm not going to claim to have the proficiency that Jack Hamilton does, but I'll be showing, uh, what's in my toolbox and different things and different tools I have that I can, uh, uh, offer you some opportunities to use. Any questions? Yes, sir. Whoa. That, that distressing tool you got, Mike, right? uh, it's a real great tool if you don't, guys don't know what it is. It's kind of like a bundle of steel. Yeah. The one I've got is uh, kind of screw top so it'll extend it out and bring it back in. Yeah. I use it for removing the paint off the ends of the track. You know, when I'm soldering track together, it takes the paint off. It works really well. I prefer it actually, over using a Dremel brush because the Dremel brush will burnish the rail, whereas the distressing tool will simply clean it. Yep. I see you were next. Okay. Who else had a question? Yes, Dave. I use it for the same thing on the. I use it for the web of the rail. Yeah. I want to solder a feeder in. Yeah. Exactly. Just use it to clean the oxidation off the web of the rail. Right. Perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. Uh, only takes five or six. Yeah, only two seconds. Really well. Okay. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? One, One final th thing, shameless plug. Uh, Joe Fugate was down here recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he spent uh, a week here. Uh, he stayed at my house. Uh, he filmed the Texas Western for Train Master Television. He did Dr. Michael Ross's video for Train Master TV. He did Den Ferris for Train Master Television. Uh, he, uh, let's see, who else? Mike Armstrong for Train Master Television. <coughs> he did uh, Jerry Hoverson for Train Master Television. And he did my layout for MRH and Train Master TV. Um, I just received my copy this morning of the proof for my MRH uh, article that's going to be published Wednesday of this week on Model Railroad Hobbyist featuring my layout. Um, the end of the month, it'll be Train Master Television that you can see the layout on there with the interview and video of the trains and stuff. And uh, also, um, I believe that my layout is scheduled to be in next month's NMRA magazine. If it's not in next month, it'll be the following month. So, very good. There you go. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. All right, that's the end of our uh, regular meeting, and we're going to take a little break. Uh, let's uh, meet back for our clinic at 10.50. Hi everybody, my name is Mike Mackey. I am uh, currently on the board of the NMRA serving as Western District Director. Glad to be here. Uh, hope I have a clinic that will make uh, a little bit of sense to you and be of interest to you. Um, I have been asked to do a clinic on what's in my toolbox. 
while I do not claim to be anywhere near this uh, knowledgeable on all the different tools that are out there, as Jack Hamilton, who does the column every month in the NMRA magazine, uh, Jackson MMR, I'm fortunate enough to have that same designation. But over the years, I've come to grow, have some tools in my toolbox that have helped me become a better modeler. So i um, like to kind of share with you what's in this box that goes with me whenever I go to conventions, uh, getting stuff ready for the, um, the contest room. There's always some last minute things that have to be repaired or tweaked up or whatever uh, for a convention. So I carry this with me if I'm going to somebody else's layout to help work on the layout or uh, do some model building or something, this box goes with me. So. The first thing I want to do is uh, talk about, this is a just a regular fishing tackle box that I got at Cabello's uh, Bass Pro Shops a while back. Um, they make them in all different sizes. This particular one comes open right here on the front. And this toolbox, I've had this toolbox probably, I want to say 15, 20 years. And it still does exactly what I need it to. Um, the top part here opens up and there's more information and, and places to store things up here. And then there's some more quick uh, information that I can grab right here if I need to. Uh, we'll talk about all that a little bit later. But I'm going to go ahead and open it up here. Uh, in these, there are four drawers in each of the, the slots right here. Um, I will start from the bottom and go up. Uh, but these actually come all the way out and uh, in this particular box uh, slide drawer uh, I've got all different types of uh, individual adhesives uh, that happen to be there uh, everything from uh, plyo bond to uh, Aileen's tacky glue uh, clear fast grab um, I've got some other stuff here this is Sticky Bond, Woodworks, Wood Adhesive, regular testers. Uh, I've got some white wood putty in here. Uh, pardon me, that, that little piece of plastic that's in here. But uh, I've got some white put, putty for modeler putty in here. Um, also, uh, here's some Type Bond wood glue in here. Um, all different types of things in here for adhesives. This is a regular graphite, graphite lubricant. I've also got some just regular modeling clay in here. Here's some more lubricant. Um, this is uh, Labelle 106. Um, and uh, all of these different things that are in here in this. These are just tie down straps and rubber bands for helping hold models together whenever I'm building a model. And that pretty much covers that one. The only reason that these pieces of strip plastic are in here is because that's the only place that I could put them and protect them in a long, um, long tray. So that's in there. I've also, I think I uh, overlooked this, has got some really fine grit sandpaper in here for touching up things and, and modeling things there. So we're gonna put this back in here and uh, snap the, the, snap it shut for protection and go on to the next drawer up. This particular drawer, um, for lack of a better term, uh, this is a drawer that is basically screwdrivers. I've got some sanding sticks and tweezers. I've got tweezers of all different sizes and shapes and uh, configurations. These right here are uh, reverse um, pressure uh, tweezers. They will hold something and even whenever you, you turn loose of them, it'll still hold apart. Uh, I've got these tweezers right here that are uh, really fine and pointed. I've got all kinds of stuff in here that you can see in here for different types of tweezers. Pardon me, my nose is itching. I apologize. Um, just regular tweezers. Here's another set here that are more curved and sharp. And be careful with these. I will promise you they will uh, stick you and you will bleed if you're not being careful on those. Um, this particular one is got a pressure on it so that if you want on this particular tweezer once you get where you want it you can pull it down and tighten up on the item and it will hold it and, and grip it so it's a regular type of tweezer 
you can use it regular or you can pull this slider down and it'll hold it in place for you. Um, let's see, a couple of screwdrivers here. This one's got magnets on it. This whole section right here is nothing but screwdrivers of different uh, shapes. This tool right here is, uh, you can get it at Micromart. It is, uh, it's called a Euro tool from Germany. And this has got, if you look at the end of it, there's all these different little bristles, steel bristles right here at the end. And uh, let me put some of these down and I will point at that right here. And you can turn the end of it right here and it will it will bring those bristles out or back in. Now, uh, this is this is a good tool for distressing wood, uh, putting little marks on it, distressing plastic uh, in a to give it a better opportunity for weathering and, and will hold weathering. Um, some people use it to brush the inside of a railhead if you're going to uh, be cleaning that. Uh, but um, you'll also have the opportunity to, to uh, you can distress wood uh, your cross ties with it. And if you're going to be painting your cross ties with different colors and stuff, you can use this to come back and distress it. This is a really, really valuable tool. You can get it at Micromark. Um, let's see, what else have I got in here uh, besides these all these different tweezer types? And, and by the way, this these tweezers right here that you see and all of these different items that are in here that's just like a third of what I've got because I've got twice as much more uh, maybe two and a half times more of these on my work desk uh, at home that I don't even have with me um, this right here is uh, a uh, slider that you put underneath the car and you can see where it's been wiping along the rails uh, you mount it underneath the car and it can do that you can uh, do uh, rail cleaning with it just a little fine piece of sandpaper um, there here is a Katie coupler screen uh, coupler pick uh, for picking up those uh, pesky little uh, Katie coupler springs whenever you lose them uh, this is I mean this are these two things right here uh, have been in my toolbox forever and they're great for uncoupling cars and you just drop it down in between cars the magnets pull the couplers apart and you back the car up and you go from there so uh, these these are like a, uh, a portable magnetic de uncoupling device they're made by Rick's products I can't tell you how long I've had these but I don't even know if they're even made anymore uh, you can probably find them at uh, uh, Rick's uh, R-I-X products if there's websites still going. Um, we got an eraser, um, a Bright Boy, which I don't use anymore. Uh, uh, this is just an eraser, though, for that. Um, I've got a couple of, um, of uh, I can't even remember. I'm having a, 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 um, a brain cramp trying to remember what these are, but these are just a tool where you slide along and you can put indentions into wood uh, and I've got a couple of these these spike wheels of different textures and different uh, numbers on there so you can uh, do that here's a um, a pin vise uh, as we walk through this these are all in the back here are different ways and, and items I can use for filing and sanding I've got uh, let's see here I'm gonna pull these all out for you um, Here's a regular bastard file. Here's a round bastard file. Uh, pick stick. Here's another file that's got uh, a rat tail file that uh, has got a little handle on it that I built. Um, this is a three-way file uh, right here on this one. Um, I've got um, other types of files here that are different thicknesses, widths, uh, intensities. Uh, I've got filing sticks, so I'm going to pull these out and show you here. Here's, an, here's another one of those uh, triangular files. Uh, again, a sanding stick. Uh, all of these, there's emery boards. Uh, those are fantastic 
for doing a last minute touch up or uh, trying to do that. This one even says Avon on it. So you can tell about where I might have picked that one up. Um, this, uh, that uh, track cleaner a minute ago is part of a Stewart HO gauge right here. Um, that's the, the track cleaning thing that I was telling you about. Uh, that's all part of this particular system. But all of these, uh, all of these files, let's see here. One, two, three. Here's a small knitting needle with a little hook on it. Four, five, six. Another little knitting needle with a hook on it. Seven different types of files right here. Everything from round to flat to wide to to fine and everything. And they all come in here and they all have different colors. So you can color code the handle. Um, I've got some drill bits in here that go with that uh, the uh, pin vise. Um, I've got uh, a small awl right here, hole punch. Um, I've got a small little hammer to tap that in. Here's another size all right here. I do have a larger hammer up here that you'll see in a minute. We get to it. But uh, these items here are just to, for being able to tap something together and uh, take care of it there. This particular item right here is another one of those locking, um, locking uh, piece of tweezers. These are exceptionally long. I like those because if you're trying to insert a person into a building or trying to, to get some detail parts and get them placed into the back of the building, you're working in a, an area that you need some, some length on, these are really, really good for that. And then uh, you just slide it up or down and it will release the, the, uh, the person or whatever you're holding in that particular area. Um, let's see, I believe this is another head for the hammer. That it's, uh, you can adjust it and put different types of heads on there uh, for a different impact. I also, in here, have a glass cutter. Uh, I use this for cutting mirrors and pieces of glass to go inside of a building or things like that. Uh, and I use this uh, periodically uh, on, the, on using a glass cutter if you've never used one before. You score the glass and then come back and turn it over and tap the glass with this little uh, metal ball on the end, and it will the glass will crack right down that score on the where you've uh, scored it and just pop right off. I learned that trick when I was uh, about 17 years old and working in a frame shop um, as a after school job. All right, so that takes care of that particular. All of these are just screwdrivers. Uh, different sizes, jeweler screwdrivers, as you can see. Uh, this is a, a little nut driver on the end of this one. Uh, I, I really am a big fan of that kind of stuff. All right, so now we're going to move on to another drawer. This particular drawer. This is what I call my sharp drawer because it's primarily got all of my exacto uh, knives, extra blades. Um, one of the things that, that uh, I learned a while back, a friend of mine told me about taking a piece of cork and, sli and slicing it down the middle and then stick your X-Acto knife into it. Now what happens is when you put that down, it will not roll off the table. This guy here could have a tendency to roll or shift on your, on your table. But if you have these and this is, I've got all these different kinds of X-Acto knives, but I've got several of these cork, um, cork, uh, uh, wine corks, and I use them and take them out. I also use these triangular pieces right here that will sit and keep it from, uh, from falling off. Uh, blades everywhere. I've got everything from a box cutter in here to all different kinds of of exactos. Here's a little exacto saw. Uh, if you've never seen this before, it's an exacto blade, but it's actually a tooth saw in here. You can use that accordingly. 
uh, doing a little fine saw work. A lot of folks don't even know that's available. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and they had no idea that Exacto made razor saws. They'd never seen one before and this is an experienced modeler. Don't know exactly uh, what rock they've been under, but uh, yeah, you can get uh, razor saws. Um, also in here is I've got some microscope cover glass for glass for windows. I've got some little clamps that I use uh, for holding buildings together and things like that. You can pick these up at uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, any hardware store. Um, don't be, uh, don't forget about just regular um, paper clips that you can use uh, and, and clamp, clamp things together. Here's another one right here of a different size and thickness. Um, the, uh, I, I've also, believe it or not, I've got a couple of pair of fingernail clippers in here because if I'm cutting um, thread or things like that and need to nip it off really tight, I can do it with those. Um, let's see, what else do I have in here? More X-Acto blades, uh, more blades, more blades, more blades all in here. One of the most important things though is a Katie Coupler gauge. I always carry that with me. And uh, up here in the top, I've got my NMRA gauge up here. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those must have and must keep in your toolbox. Um, I've got a, uh, a piece of metal bar that is absolutely square and heavy. I can use this to weight things down or uh, make an, uh, an absolute 90 bend in something that I was working on. Uh, so that's there. Uh, here's another little uh, saw blade that I can uh, put into a jeweler saw. This is a, this is a uh, spare blade I've got there. All right, so let's uh, keep going and move on to the next, next drawer and see what we've got. Final drawer that I have here is markers and brushes. I've got brushes of all different types in here, even down to Q-tips. I've got microfiber uh, uh, pieces of fabric uh, for cleaning things off. Uh, I have got my uh, angles to use on my cutting tool. I can put that on uh, and use it in conjunction with this particular cutting mat that's in the top up here. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute, but I use this for for cutting uh, strip wood, decals out, um, pieces of plastic, whatever, and these give me the angles that I need to go on there. Um, let's put this back up here. I have got, um, these are uh, small pieces of bird shot, <laughs> believe it or not, and I use this bird shot for weight in cars. It uh, gets into tinier places than, uh, than you can get with uh, BBs, and, and this is lead, so it's, uh, it's got a very good weight to it. Um, I've got a syringe. I've got a track gauge right here. This particular one's a narrow gauge track gauge. Um, I have got chopsticks. I've got several of those. Some are busted open, some are not. Um, a wire brush. And then I come over and I've got all types of markers. I've got uh, these markers right here are, uh, are made by um, Copic. And if you open them up on one end, it's a broad tip. On the other end, it's a very fine tip. And I use these for touching up uh, and adding color in certain areas. Um, I've got all different kinds of colors. Here's another one that's in a brown. This one's in a gray. Um, I've got uh, a pink marker here, a pink Sharpie. Here's a black one. I also use uh, markers that are used for touching up your furniture. Uh, these right here come in different colors. This one is sand. I've got another one right here that is, uh, this one is saddle leather. 
Uh, I've got another right here that is scratch out dark brown. Uh, all of these different markers are are uh, very very useful and add a, you can add a little touch of color wherever you're looking for and it uh, works out really really nice. It's very neat and very precise. Um, let's see what is that? Uh, just a cap for a, a bottle there just an extra. So the next area that we're going to move to is what's in the top of my toolbox. It's where I carry a lot of my tools. Uh, you're going to find uh, I've got a lot of pliers, needle nose pliers. Um, we've got all of these different types. I've got some that have bends in them, some that come to a point. These come to even a finer point. These have a little grip on the end of them. They come in and they kind of have a bull nose on them. Uh, these are regular uh, needle nose pliers that you would find anywhere. These are a little broader base. If you notice the end of them and this one, they have different uh, widths on the end of them for holding different items. So all of these different tools are in there. Um, as I come over here, I've got, uh, I've got forceps right here. This is a magnet that I can use to help pick up parts, but it's also good for uh, opening up reed switches on, on uh, cars or pieces of rolling stock where you want to turn something on and off with a reed switch that is a, is a magnetized reed switch. Um, let's see, we've already talked about that. I've got a speed square. It's actually a machinist square. Uh, this one is made by Woodsmith Fine Tools. Uh, it is a very, very nice. It's got some heft to it, and you can really get a nice square uh, cut and measurement on it. I also have some pieces of uh, angle iron that have been cut that I picked up at a machine shop, and those are good for making 90-degree curves. Uh, as I get older, I'm finding I'm using this particular magnifying glass a little bit more than what I used to in the past. Uh, here is the trusty tool that everybody needs to have, and that's an NMRA uh, measuring, item, a measuring ruler in scale. Uh, I use this all the time uh, when I'm building buildings, uh, no matter what scale it is. If I want to make sure my building's measurements are right, then I will... Uh, do some informational search on the internet and then come back and now I can cut to size on windows or doors or porch widths or whatever I'm doing. It's very important. Um, I've got a complete set of Allen wrenches in here. You never know when you're going to have to open up a, a little screw or something with an Allen wrench. Let's see. Here is a small clamp um, that I use to clamp buildings together. Uh, I've also got that same type of clamp in plastic that's from Exacto. Um, let's see what else I have. I have a uh, little stand to set a soldering iron on if I need to have that with me. I've got some soldering paste. Um, let's see. Right here is a tubing cutter from K&S. You can put this in, uh, piece of tubing in, and then just turn it around, and it will give you an absolute clean cut on a piece of brass tubing or uh, steel tubing. Uh, this is a very, very um, good little piece, and it, it saves you from having to crimp it and try to figure out what you're going to do there and, and get a good clean round cut. But this, this right here will do that. Um, let's see. I've also got a very fine bottle here. This is a, like a nasal spray bottle, but I've inserted a piece of plastic into it and then put a mechanical pencil end on the end. So if I pull this out, you can see the fine point right here on that mechanical pencil right here at the end of my fingers. And I'll put the needle up there just so you can see it. That will allow me to put glue in a very, very fine position. And, and you don't just put a big glob out there. Uh, you can really get accurate with how you're placing your glue with this mechanical pencil. So it's a very, very simple thing. 
you just take your uh, your piece of plastic here, like from an eyedropper or a, a um, uh, food coloring dispenser, and then you just put this the mechanical pencil end over the end of it. It'll stick right on there and it'll stay. And then I just take a regular hat pin and stick down in the top. And this glue's been in here for over a year and it doesn't dry out. It's very good. Uh, some more Aileen's up here. I actually have some Legos that I picked up. Legos are great for trying to get a 90 degree on a building. You can uh, snap these in and uh, snap this in right. Let's see. Right there. Let's snap it. Okay. And now I've got a 90 degree T right there. I can do the same thing with this smaller piece and snap it in. Just like that and when it's lined up it's exactly 90 degrees because Legos are square at least these are uh, you can put these in for building braces on the inside of your buildings and you never have a problem with uh, them being out of square so that's just something really good there uh, and they're dirt cheap uh, you can find Legos at the dollar store you might could even find Legos uh, uh, it, that are 3d printed and so uh, I know that I've printed some Legos myself on my 3D printer. Um, always want to have a pencil in your in your uh, toolbox. Never know when that's going to happen. Here's another. Uh, this is another uh, pair of tweezers, but this particular one has a foot on it or a brace around it, so that if I'm working on something, I can hold it in between the tweezers and then set it down. And it, it'll hold it up while I'm working on it so I can work with both hands and do some soldering, um, gluing of, of parts or uh, legs on people or whatever if I need to. Um, I always carry a flashlight. Uh, this is a little LED light. It does also have a, a, uh, a magnet on the end. And this one telescopes. So it's really good for that. You can use it as a pointer. You can look at it. And not only that, but it also bends around accordingly. So it's a neat little neat little flashlight tool. Uh, I urge you to get one if you have any interest whatsoever. But that's a good little tool right there to have. All right. Um, I've, got, uh, I've got different, uh, more, more things up here in the top. I've got another another uh, razor blade case cutter. I've got more uh, cotton swabs. I've got some more microfibers that are just making it easy to get to stuff. Um, right here are some large uh, bead head hat pins. Uh, I use those for marking things or for holding some different things together. If I need to hold it together while glue sits, I can use that. Um, I always carry a protractor in my, uh, I mean a, a uh, uh, I guess that, what is that, uh, a, a uh, I used it for geometry, but you know what I'm talking about, it gives you all the angles. It's not a protractor, because a protractor is the, the item that you have that you're helping draw with and measuring distance with, but uh, those help me get better angles. Um, I've also got, and the, you can get this little tool right here. This comes from Exacto. It's a locking grip plier. So let me show you what I'm talking about. I can take this, I can put it on something, and whenever I pull it down, I can slide this notch forward, and it holds it like a pair of vice grips. Uh, hadn't seen too many of these before. Uh, it falls into that category of what will Exacto think of next, but then whenever I'm ready to release it, I just release the the slide on the top, and this comes right out. It's very adjustable. I can show you that I can hold this right here the same way, just slide it down, and it holds that in place just like that. So you can get this from Exacto as well. Um, 
and it comes right out. The final thing I want to tell you about that's in my toolbox is something, well, I'll tell you one more thing. Uh, this falls under tips and tricks. Uh, I carry a uh, shot glass, uh, not for drinking, but for using it to hold and put down, I will put glue in the top of it right here so that whenever I'm, I am uh, gluing items or putting items together in a, uh, for uh, a model or whatever, I can put a dab of glue right here whenever uh, I get through. If it, I can wipe it out. If it's already dried, I simply just come in here and peel it out, and this will be uh, pristine and clear, and uh, it's a good place to store your glue. Um, learned that from uh, another friend of mine here locally who came up with that idea. Um, but finally, that we're going to wrap up with are these clamps from uh, Kaufman. Uh, Kaufman Engineering. Uh, you can find their website at Kaufman with a C, C O F F M A N E N G, abbreviate the engineering.com. They have all kinds of these clamps. Now, this particular one is a 90 degree clamp. You can clamp uh, building uh, sides into it, bring it in, absolutely fit your 90 degrees right here and then it gives you a slot to put your glue in right back here. They make them in probably, I wanna say four or five different sizes and lengths. Uh, I've got some at home that aren't in the toolbox right now that are about, I wanna say 10 inches long um, and everything in between that one and this one. This is one of the smaller ones. They do make one that's even smaller, uh, but uh, then they have what this is a parallel clamp slide your building wall in and you can do a butt joint uh, with the two pieces and glue it here or here and it will hold your butt joint together on the brick wall or something like that if you want to do it so um, that pretty much wraps up everything that's in this toolbox I do rotate things around from time to time and I'll take some if I know I've got a a special need for something and I'm going to uh, to need it and I will pull it off of my desk at home uh, I will put it in the toolbox and rotate those tools around uh, I hope this has been beneficial I uh, hope you've enjoyed the clinic and a little tour through my toolbox you guys have a great day talk to you soon